We began a, a whole new sermon series on the book of James. The book of James was written by Jesus' half-brother. Very, very interesting because during Jesus' life, James was a skeptic. He did not believe his brother when his brother said, I'm the son of God. In fact, the brothers and sisters tried to have him kind of put in a straitjacket at one point and take him home. That, that really kind of tells us what their mindset was when Jesus is going around and healing people and, and blessing the bread and, and the fish and doing all these miracles, his brothers and sisters still refused to believe. It's kind of like, I was raised with you. I know what it's like to be around you. I can't believe that you're God's son. Anyway, but James then, at later in life, and I think probably because directly a result of the resurrection, James becomes a believer so much so that he becomes the head, the leader, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Very interesting. I mean, to move from this point where you say, my brother is out of his mind, he needs to be locked up, to the point where at the very beginning of James 1, he calls himself a slave of his brother, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's... that's you know, anybody that you've ever come in contact with that is skeptical about the claims of Jesus, you should just be able to point them right to James's life and say, oh, okay, if, if you're skeptical about that, what is the cause then that has moved Jesus' brother to be from skeptic to the head of the church? You know, as legend goes, it's not in the Bible. This is just kind of one of those old wives' tales, and I don't know if it's true or not. But James was martyred. He, he was... There was a time when persecution came to those early Christians in the city of Jerusalem where, where the Roman government would go to somebody and say, recant the, what you believe about the, this guy, Jesus, that he is God. James said, I can't. And there's two different theories. One says that he was actually taken to the top of the temple and thrown down. Another one said that he had his head bashed in with rocks. I don't know, I wasn't there. But he did die as a result of refusing to deny his brother's deity. That's, that should just be, if for anybody that's a skeptic, you should be able to look at that story and then begin to see Jesus in a different light. But James writes this book. It's found at the end of the New Testament. And he, James is kind of one of those no-nonsense guys. He doesn't, he, he, when he writes this book... He writes it in a very practical manner. He doesn't spend a lot of time developing theology. He doesn't, he doesn't spend a lot of time trying to prove that his brother was God's son. He goes right to the point. He has a singular purpose, and, and that is this. If you say you're a Christian, you need to live like it. And you need to grow from, from being born again to full spiritual maturity. He, I mean, right out of the gate in, in chapter 1, in the verse, first five or six verses, I mean, he just punches us in the nose. He begins to talk about trials of life, the struggles that we all go through. And, and, and there's a wide variety. He doesn't just name two or three. He just talks about it in very general terms, tries, tries to umbrella all of the things that we have to go through in life. And so here this morning... He has moved, we're going to move from the trials of life to its next of kin, temptation. So let's kick it off by watching a video. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. Mm -hmm. 
I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. So it's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you I'd give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> That's called the marshmallow test. You, we all know that feeling, don't we? Yeah, you can't, are you one of those people that can resist the urge to give in to your desires? Even when there's a promise... You know, that if you can just wait, if you can endure, something better exists at the end of it. it there's a greater blessing that, that, you, that will await you if you can just be patient and, and not give in to that temptation. In the verses that we're going to read today, James wants to help the reader to understand what temptation is, how it works, and how we can resist it. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of James, chapter 1. Now, I read out of the New Living Translation. Uh, it's written on about a third grade level, and that's about where I'm at. I, I do have it on the, on the screen if you'd like to follow along, or if, uh, if your translation is a little different. Look at James 1.12, and it says this, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, this is the bridge from his prior discussion about trials into this, uh, this discussion that we're going to have this morning about temptation. And he uses this, this verse right here of 12 to talk to us about how there is a blessing that awaits people who handle temptation and testing appropriately. And he's not necessarily talking about this life. Of course, that's true. If, if we can resist temptation in this life, there is a blessing that can be found in that. But there's also a blessing that awaits us in the afterlife if we can endure the testing and temptation appropriately. He uses the term there at the end. He says, afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, just for clarification purposes, when he says the crown of life, he's not talking about salvation because the assumption that we've went into this book, and I should have said it at the very beginning, James is writing this letter to believers. And, and so whenever he talks in these terms, he says, they will receive the crown of life. Well, 
For a believer, we already assured the crown of life. What is he talking about then? Uh, apparently, and this is something that I haven't really wrapped my arms fully around yet. I, there's a lot about the Bible that I don't even understand. But there's this idea that exists in the Bible that when we get there, that there are certain rewards that await me that will be different from the rewards that you will receive. That's this crown that he's talking about. He's saying that there's going to be something, a future blessing that I will receive upon that time. If I, if I endure my trials of life and I go through all of these temptations appropriately, not giving in, and I endure to the end, when I finally pass away and I stand before my Lord, there is some reward, some treasure chest, some benefit that I'm going to receive that will be different from yours in heaven. When he calls it a crown of life, what he's talking about is, have you ever seen the old pictures of people that used to run in the Olympic Games during the Roman times? And the victor would often be crowned with a laurel of leaves. You, you know what I'm talking about. You've seen those images. That's what he's talking about. And this is a cultural reference to being the, the victor in those Olympic Games. This is the prize for running well. Running the race of life well. That not, not a reference to eternal life. That's already been said and done. That's guarantee. This is the reward that we will receive in eternity. For those of us that run the race of this life well, and we go through all of our trials, and we endure our temptations well, appropriately, in God-honoring ways, there is something that awaits us in heaven, some sort of crown or reward, and, and it will be different for all of us. I, I, don't, I don't have any clue how that all works out, but that's what the Scripture indicates. Look at verse 13. This is what it says, now he moves into kind of the temptation part. And remember, when you are being tempted, the first thing I want you to see this morning is everybody has, just like everybody goes through trials, everybody goes through temptations. Temptation is that internal struggle that we experience. Sometimes it's a result of those trials, but it's the temptation to kind of circumvent the spiritual maturity process when we do that, we betray God's invitation to life. So it's like there's the path that lays before us and, and that God has laid out. And if I follow that appropriately and I endure my trials and, and I go through my temptations well, that is the process that God is taking me and, and, and developing me to full spiritual matur maturity. Temptation says this. No, you don't have to go through that. Just go around it. You do it your own way, man. There's no sense in you having to go through all of that pain. Just kind of just go the back door. But temptation in this right here says that everybody goes through that. Everybody has to endure, face temptation. Temptation is an equal opportunity oppressor. It is no respecter of persons. It has no limits. There are no titles that, that can uh, eliminate you from enduring those things. There's no favorites. Temptation doesn't say that person's off limit. Every single person that can hear my voice this morning will face a temptation of some kind. And, and temptation, you, you, I'm sure you're already aware of this, temptation is the master of camouflage. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it has lots of different masks that it wears. Everybody has their own little idiosyncrasies, their, their own little weaknesses. All of us have different moral natures. So the thing that tempts you may not tempt me, and then what tempts me may not tempt you. You know, I've, I've talked to you about my temptations. Um, and in the interest of this morning's sermon, I ate this. Simply because I, I needed that to put this out. That's my temptation. I was at Walmart not too long ago and I saw Susan. And she reminded me not to go eat any ice cream. I, I did. But not, now this isn't necessarily my favorite flavor. I kind of like the mint chocolate chip or the chocolate chip. But this had to do, right? It was out of the other stuff. But this is cookie two-step. Man, it was good. This is my temptation. 
some of y'all who are not human don't like sweets. <laughs> Those are the type of people you don't want in your life, okay? And by the way, I, you're going to call me weird. I eat my ice cream with a fork. Uh-huh. Go there, huh? I love it. That's my temptation, though. I mean, I can sit with Netflix and eat half this thing, sometimes the whole thing. It's not good for me. Is there anything inherently wrong with ice cream? No. It's not evil. What evil is is whenever I allow my desires to say, oh, go ahead and have one more bite. And I do that all the time. <laughs> so, like, so like this week, you know, I was eating this for you, of course. <laughs> and, and it was at lunchtime, and I go home by myself and eat a sandwich at lunch, and I always have a little ice cream afterwards. And so I'm watching ESPN, and I have a, I have a fork, and I'm like, okay, I need to quit now. And then I kind of look down and go, I'm not looking so bad, I'll have another fork, you know? <laughs> but what happens is it eventually catches up to me, right? And I'm going, oh, I feel bloated. Uh, there's nothing wrong with ice cream. The way that we consume it, though, I, I, we, we need to be on hyper alert for temptation in our lives. When temptation comes, that sometimes happens. We recognize it immediately, right? You ever been in a situation where you immediately, I mean, your synapses begin to fire and, and warning bells going off, this is an opportunity, don't fall for the temptation. Don't give in. Now, it could be ice cream. It could be in the way that you display your anger. I mean, temptation exists in all different forms. It could be the temptation. Maybe you have a juicy little morsel of gossip, right? And you want to tell somebody. And, and it's going, go ahead and tell them. They're, they're not going to tell anybody. And you're going, mm, 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 mm. you know, like the little kid. You know, that's how temptation comes to us. When it happens, we're on hyper alert. We know that this is an opportunity we could give in. We could make a huge mistake here. But sometimes temptation kind of sneaks up on us, don't it? It, it? it happens in very subtle ways. We don't see what's happening until we've, we've given in to the temptation and it's already become a sin. You know, we may be fully aware of what our weaknesses are. I know what my weaknesses are. I'm sure you have an idea what your weaknesses are. But that doesn't always stop us from giving in, does it? I know that that's my weakness. But I still convince myself that it'd be all right. It doesn't stop me from giving in. That's a minor thing. Well, to me, it's a major thing. For you, it's probably a minor thing. But just think of the major things in life. The, the drug addictions, the, the broken marriages, the alcoholism. I mean, it just there's a plethora of things that we fall victim in, uh, to that temptation. And when we do that, mark it down, disaster follows in the wake. That's the way it works. You, sin doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's consequences to those things. And, and that temptation giving in to it, it just wait. Disaster is right behind it. And, and it causes us to make another grave mistake. When we give in to temptation, we, we often try to shift the blame, don't we? Right? You know what I'm talking about. I mean, those times when, when we give in to temptation, and then we begin to look for the blame of why we gave in to the temptation. Right? Well, I wouldn't have ate that if God wouldn't have had that there at the Walmart at the time. I told God before I went in to Walmart, I said, I'm not going to eat any ice cream, but if I see that cookie two-step, God, I'm going to buy it because you want me to have it, right? When we do that sometimes with relationships, God put her in my life. God put him in my life. Even though it's not a healthy relationship. That's what we do. Sometimes we level the blame right at God and say that He is the reason that I have been tempted. James said, not so fast, my friend. Look at, look at verse, the end of verse 13. He says, and remember when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. James says, you cannot use that as an excuse for giving in to your temptation. He says, because God is never tempted to do wrong and He never tempts anyone else so me saying 
oh, I'm going to buy the ice cream, even though I know that if I buy it, I'm just going to sit and eat it, and I don't need it. But me going, God, I'm going to buy it because uh, if, if you put it there, I'll get it because they're telling me it's okay. I mean, what we're doing is we're just shifting the blame here. God is never tempted. I mean, He's holy, He's pure, and He never tempts anyone. Why would God, who, whose greatest desire is for you and I to live in perfect relationship with Him, why would He ever put us in a position trying to entice us to sin? That's silly. When you read that verse if you, in the original Greek, that original Greek Whenever it says God does not tempt, what it's really saying is that God doesn't even remotely associate with temptation. He doesn't want anything to do with it. There is no sin whatsoever in him. The only time God kind of comes into the reaction or reacts with temptation is to provide us with a way out. Or sometimes, he, even though he doesn't bring that temptation, he may allow that into our life. That's part of those trials. Well, then, I know how you think. So if God didn't do it, well, then it must be Satan, right? You got the angel on one side and the devil on the other. If it's not the angel that's whispering to me, it's got to be Satan. Well, sometimes Satan can be the instigator of our temptation, but not always. I'm not going to discount his responsibility in that. But Scripture doesn't really indicate that. The responsibility is ours alone. Look at the next verse. It says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice and drag us away. You see, this is the second thing, that temptation is really the result of our own desires. It, it's because that all, every single one of us have a little depraved black heart. We're all sinful and, and temptation comes as a result of the things that we desire. Now, that's not a popular truth. I know. Nobody wants to be the person that stands up and accepts the responsibility for their mistakes. We excuse our bad behavior, don't we? Because, and we do that by uh, blame your parents, right? Well, that's the way they raised me. Or we blame our family, you know, your brothers and sisters. Maybe they beat up on you. So we blame how we was raised or our upbringing. Sometimes we blame our friendships. Teenagers like to do this a lot, peer pressure, right? Oh, I, if I didn't have those friends, I would have never started drinking and I would have never become an alcoholic and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's kind of another way that we shift the blame. Or, or we state, we talk about our own personal, maybe something like education. Well, I wasn't smart enough. I, I don't have, I, my education doesn't allow me to have the opportunities that they had, so I had to kind of go the different route. Sometimes we blame the government, lame. Sometimes we stealth blame God. And what I mean by that is we say, well, I was born this way. It's in my DNA. I, I, I have these tendencies because that's the way God made me. Or we say God brought you to me. That's, that's kind of a backdoor blame to God, which isn't really directing. It's, it's saying that there's something within us, but then acknowledging that, that something within us is because that's the way God wants me to be. Now, temptation may have been affected by some of these things. I will not discount that. They, those trials in our life may have formed us and, and caused us to have certain desires. So if, if we had an absent father, maybe we have a desire to feel the, the love of a, of a male, of an adult male. I'm, I'm not discounting that. Those can play a part. But the responsibility for giving in to the temptation falls squarely on my shoulders. I'm the one that's responsible. My sin is not someone else's doing. It's all my fault. The very root of this is, is you need to ask the question, will I trust God in this or will I seek my own desires in my own way? Notice that at the very end of that it says, temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. So while I was studying for this, one, uh, very interesting how James worded this. The, the wording that he uses here 
is the same wording that they used to use when they would refer to a hunt or fishing. We can all relate with that. He's talking about, you know, luring and coaxing the prey out into the open, just waiting to pounce. It's, it's, the, it's the idea of baiting the hook. You know, I, I'm not a good fisherman. But I know that good fishermen know how to bait a hook in such a way that whenever it's in front of the fish, that the fish can't resist it. That's the language that he's talking about. That, that our desires make that thing look attractive. And, and, and it makes it also look harmless. I mean, that's the reason. If the fish knew that if I bite that, a hook's going to go through my lip, he'd never bite it, would he? I mean, so the bait looks harmless. That's what temptation does. That's what our desires do. No temptation ever appears as a temptation. They don't come out and say, I'm a temptation. Look at me. Take me in. Temptation always appears a little bit more alluring than what it really is. So it, our desires have this capability of taking whatever our desire is or temptation and then adding a little bit to it and convincing us that it's actually more than what it really is. <laughs> That's what happens with my ice cream, right? Oh my word. Just think how good you'd feel if you could eat half of that thing. Now, yeah. it doesn't always work that way. The temptation hides the fact that if I give in to this desire, that eventually what follows behind it is sorrow or punishment. Temptation likes to convince us that we can kind of conceal our indulgement. Oh, go ahead and do that. Nobody will ever find out. How often does that work out? I mean, think about it. If you think about it seriously, and just think about what's happening in our culture, in, in, in our local communities today, where people have convinced themselves that I can indulge in this activity, this behavior, nobody will ever find out. Eventually, your sin will find you out. Look at verse 15. The, these desires, they give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Uh, giving in to temptation, we do that a lot of times because of how that makes us feel or how we convince it will make us feel. This is a great example of why spiritual maturity is so important. You know who makes decisions based upon how it makes you feel? Children. Children are, they act on the basis of feeling. That's the reason why when, we, when I talk in terms of spiritual maturity and talking about going from being born again to a fully developed follower of Christ, that I talk about the dynamic of how immature Christians fall easily into temptation because they allow their feelings to determine their behavior. Spiritually mature Christians understand that the temptation exists, but they also see beyond that to the sorrow and the disgust and, and, the, and the punishment that exists, and they have the capability and the capacity to turn away from that. They know that it's not God's best, but if, if you insist on being a spiritually immature Christian, you will give in to temptation over and over and over again because you're just like a child and you will make your decisions based upon how it makes you feel. Spiritually mature believers, they don't operate that way. They understand that Christian living is a matter of the will. It's not a matter of how it makes you feel. It's a matter of what does God have to say about this and what's God's best for me. Not how does it make me feel. And the scriptures go on and it says, these desires give birth to sinful actions. Gives birth. <laughs> That's a great term. When desire meets opportunity, they come together and we act on that. Sin is born out of that. Sometimes literally. Our desires at that point, if, if we continue to feed and nature our desires. So if, if I know that 
my weakness, pardon me, but I know we've got children, is sexual in nature. And I began to feed that through the use of pornography. It's just like a child. It doesn't just stay stagnant. It grows. When you feed your desires and you nurture them, inevitably you will act on them. And when you satisfy these desires in ways outside of God's will, that's what gets us into trouble. James says it gives birth to sin. So that baby is born, and that baby, when it's born, a baby is innocent. <laughs> it's unthreatening. And so we see that, and it's like, oh, that's not such a big deal. It's cute. Look at, I feel so much better being around the baby. But just wait till that baby matures. When that, you feed that baby, that sinful behavior, whatever it is, and you nurture it and it grows and it's going to become an adult at some point and you're not going to be able to control it. Have you ever raised a teenager? Eventually they become adults and you can't control them no more. That's what happens with our sin if we, if we feed them and nurture them. James's audience here is other Christians, other believers. Whenever he says at the end, when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. He's, since he's talking to Christians, he's not talking about spiritual death. You don't lose your salvation. The terminology he's using there for death, it's a Jewish terminology. It's talking about uh, a separation. That's the, that's the root of that word, is separation. Our fellowship with the Lord is broken when we give in to our desires. When, when those sinful when, when that becomes a sinful behavior. It's not a loss of salvation. James isn't saying here that if you give in to temptation and you sin that you're going to lose your salvation. That's all he's saying. He's saying that the sin that is born becomes a barrier in our relationship with our Creator. That's oftentimes while I, I may counsel Christians who, who lay, uh, labor in vain, in prayer, they come and they say, God's not answering my prayer. Sometimes it's the result of a, a sinful temptation or behavior that we've nurtured in our life. It's created a barrier with God. and It's almost like God's saying, until you get that cleaned up, I'm not going to talk to you. Deal with that first. Clear up that line of communication. And we can have a discussion about this. When he says... Death, he's talking about there is no spiritual vitality that exists within that person. You're almost becoming numb to the ways of God. Look at verse 16. So don't be misled, my dear brothers. Don't be, don't be misled. He's saying don't be deceived. Don't uh, be mis misinformed. Well, he's talking about self-deception here. He's saying don't talk yourself into this. It's the self-deception that makes us want to blame God so quick and excuse ourselves. That's what he's talking about. He's, he's saying that it, you can buy into the rhetoric that's around you and come to the understanding that you don't have any part or parcel in your sin. Contemporary psychology has profited off of this fact for years. That's the reason why they have a tendency, when you go in and you talk about your struggles, your trials, or your temptation, contemporary psychology will want to take you back to your childhood and find something that caused you to do what you did today. And presenting with you, here's the reason why you can excuse your behavior. They've made a mint off of that. The scriptures say, don't be misled. Don't listen to what the world has to say about this. Verse 17, whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father. So the things that God gives us will not be tempt full of temptation. They will not be harmful for us. They will not lead us into sin. So the things you want to know if, if, if this is a, a, a temptation or a sinful behavior, just think, is this going to be for my benefit? 
If it's not, it's not from God because God is the giver of all good things. He's the source of all goodness. And that strongly contrasts with my wickedness. I mean, it should be evident when we see these things that, that come to us from our desires and we should be able to stack them up against, well, is this something that is good for me? Is this something that God has brought into my life or is there a potential for disaster? If there is, it's not from God. Let me read through this and we'll go back. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or cast a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us His true word. And when we out of all creation and we out of all creation became His prized possession. So James here at the very end, he's wrapping up this discussion about temptation and he's saying, don't lose sight of the good things that God has given you in life. Don't lose sight of the grace that has been extended to you and I from up above. All things that God has given us were meant for our good. It has always been this way. It will always be this way. I'm inconsistent. I don't know about y'all. I'm completely inconsistent. Some weeks I can go without a, a spoon full of this. And some weeks I can eat this in about 30 minutes. Right? We're inconsistent. God's not. He, he's unchanging. He'll never get any worse. And there's no way he can ever get any better. He's already the best he can be. And that strongly contrasts with who I am as a human being. It says in the hair, it talks about light. And it says he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. When I read that stuff, sometimes that's fluff to me. I'm not a real poetic guy. But whenever I begin to study what that particular sentence meant, it's talking about how, you know how when the, when the sun comes up and it moves from horizon, from the east over here to the west, the shadows shift as the light becomes more intense. And then as it falls, the, the light becomes less intense and the shadows move. So light is always changing in that regard, right? The, the, the heavenly bodies. And he's saying right here, he's talking about God's not like that. God is a consistent light. He doesn't shift like the sun. He, he doesn't grow more intense here. He's full on all the time. All the time he is good. Verse 18, the most impactful part of this, it says that he chose to give birth. I, I, I love that line of theology. That's one of my favorite theological points of all time is the fact that God has chosen you and I. He was intentional. The, the act of sending his son to the cross for my sin was an intentional act. It's not reactionary. It's not a knee-jerk, uh, in the spur of the moment decision. God is very intentional and He's saying, we are going to draw you back from that which you have fallen into. God mindfully made the decision to send His Son for you and for me. He purchased you intentionally. You ever been at Walmart, been checking out with a little child? And as those things go down the belt, it's like beep, 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 beep. And then all of a sudden you see a beep, beep, and you look down and it's like a Reese's cup. And your kid's over there going, you, you didn't mean to purchase that. It's kind of an unintentional purchase. God reaches up and gets the whole box full of Reese's and just dumps them out and says, I want all of them. He's intentional about purchasing these things. It's a decision that he mindfully made. And he doesn't do it because I've earned it or I deserve it. Uh-uh. He did it even though I really deserve hell. There's really nothing good within me. I'm depraved at my root. But he intentionally purchased me. My salvation is completely unmerited. Did nothing to earn it. And if I did nothing to earn it, how then can I do anything to lose it? You and I are exceedingly valuable to Him. Sometimes we want to convince ourselves that God doesn't love us. That's just simply not true. 
When you, want to, when you want to start telling those lies to yourself, just look to the cross. The cross says you're worth every drop of blood. He is faithful for my salvation. He's faithful for your salvation. That means that at some point in the future, I can count on him to make good on all of the promises he's made me. And he has promised in his word that if I trust his son as the payment for my sins, I will one day be in heaven. I can count on that. He's faithful for that. Whatever good has been shown to me, whatever good that has been shown to you, that's just a little spoonful of what's going to be in heaven. Someday we'll be able to sit down and eat the whole thing. I can't wait. Let's pray. Father, how good you are to us. Hey God, I, I'll be the first one in the room to stand up and say, I fall into temptation regularly. I want to circumvent the process of spiritual maturity. I, I want to take shortcuts. Those times that I give in to temptation, I want to shift the blame. But God, the truth is that, um, that you still love me even through it all. Lord, we, we recognize that when we give in to those temptations that sin is born and that is ugly and, and dis disgusting to you. But Lord, even in the midst of that, you will still love us. There's still a promise that you will make good on. And for that, that's the reason we rejoice. So we give you all the praise, glory, and power for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. That's all we have for today. You're dismissed. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next week.